Hello and welcome to Explain Apologetics. We are privileged today to have uh, a world-renowned apologist joining us here in Explain Apologetics. Uh, we have Dr. Michael Brown, our special guest today. Uh, just to give you a brief intro before we get to uh, Dr. Michael Brown. Dr. Michael Brown did his PhD in ancient Near Eastern languages and literature from New York University. Uh, he's an author of many books, uh, including one that we'll be promoting today later at the end of uh, this interview. Uh, and one more thing is that, uh, uh, yeah, one more thing I needed to mention is that Dr. Brown is also uh, a contributor for the Oxford Dictionary of Jewish Religion. It's a pleasure to have you with us at Explain Apologetics, Dr. Michael Brown. Great to be with you, Samuel. Thanks. Indeed. Yeah, so we, 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 we kind of put it out there, and, and I mentioned yesterday to, to those of us from the Explain Apologetics page as well, uh, about a week or two ago, uh, I've had the privilege of, of debating uh, Nadir Ahmad, and, and I realized about a week before I did that, um, we, I realized that you had had some sort of, not a debate, uh, <laughs> it was a, a sort of uh, uh, like, like just a, an interview where he was supposed to ask you questions, and, and that's quickly deteriorated into something else. Uh, so I was just going to ask you this, and this is a sincere question, Dr. Dr. Brown, uh, and I want you to be really, really honest with us here because we need to know the truth. Are you running away from Nadir Ahmad? Because that's what he seems to be claiming uh, even during the debate we had with him. Oh, no, 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 God forbid. Uh, first, uh, it was a complete travesty. It was basically a steamroller versus a mouse. It, it was, Nadir's performance was absolutely embarrassing. There must be a hundred Islamic apologists that can do a better job than, than Nadir. It was, it was embarrassing. His arguments were disgraceful. Uh, he lied through his teeth. So no, rather than run uh, from it, I would run to a debate with someone like that uh, to expose their error. But the reason that I'm not gonna debate him is because he, he lied to us completely. He 100% misrepresented things in, in a shocking way. I've, I've very rarely, in my decades of debating and dialoguing, seen uh, anyone stoop this low. And uh, I'm not sure if he's even respected within the Islamic community. But what happened was we received an email, which I, which I read on the air repeatedly from a group called Mercy for Mankind. Now there is a legitimate group with that name, but, but he used a slightly different uh, website, one that, that may not actually be the same group. But this group allegedly wrote to us, said that they heard uh, my interview with David Wood about is Muhammad prophesied in the Bible, and they were somewhat shaken by the arguments we raised, and they don't want to misrepresent anything. They don't have any Bible experts on their team. So uh, could they uh, ask someone to, to interview me and ask me questions, as, and I would function as a Bible expert? So I, I wasn't sure what to make of it, if they were being honest or not. We said, sure, we'll do it. And then they said, okay, you'll be uh, discussing something with a fellow named Nadir Ahmad. Find it. Didn't even look up anything to see who he was. If I had looked it up, I would have seen immediately that he's completely discredited and, and not worthy of debate or dialogue as a dishonest man. But uh, it's fine, they wanted to ask me questions. Started, uh, I saw all the reasons that people spoke of his dishonesty and his unworthiness. But then my assistant Dylan followed up with Mercy for Mankind, saying this is real travesty, etc. Well, it turned out there was no such group. It was all Nadir. He made the whole thing up. Okay. If, That's the group, to me. <laughs> if the group actually exists out there, I, I think there is a group by that actual name. We never heard from them. It was him the whole time claiming to be them so he could set this up. So I'm not going to give a person like that the time of day. Why in the world would I debate an outright liar and, and deceiver? And the more Dylan confronted and we said, hey, we just want to speak with someone from Mercy for Mankind. We want to speak. No, 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 no. Never heard from anyone. So the whole thing was a sham. And, and look, I am sure there are Islamic apologists out there who are very sincere, who seek to be ethical, uh, who would never do anything like this who are thoroughly embarrassed. Uh, I, I mean, the, these debates on, on my channel or the dialogue I have with them on my channel and David would post it on his, it's like 99.9% .9, uh, 
uh, to, to 0.01%, you know, with thumbs up. So people are embarrassed by them. So I'm sure there are folks out there uh, who do a better job and who are ethical, but no, not, not Nadir. I'm very, very sad to say that we have the whole email chain to prove every word of what I said. Right, right. So because, uh, I, and, and I, you see, I didn't, I had no idea of the background story about as to what I, I, I saw the entire video because before the debate, Nadir actually shared that exchange with me. Uh, and he said, you know, you look at this because this is the approach I'll be taking. Um, but uh, so I actually looked at that and actually thought it was, yeah, uh, it, it was not a debate at all. Uh, but it was, it was really strange in the debate that I think at least twice he mentioned uh, that uh, the reason you are avoiding him is because you know what he is saying is true. Uh, and I guess <laughs> the other thing that kept coming up is that uh, what I'm saying, and which is basically kind of the exact same thing you said, uh, that we are interpreting the text, but that what he is saying is directly from the text. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how he gets that because particularly you're, you're, from what I heard you do and what I did, we, we took the words uh, becha and also uh, to, to mean that uh, this is directly, that's, those are the exact words taken from the text and, uh, and the scripture kind of interprets itself, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, again, it was, it was quite bizarre and I've done many debates over the years and I've had serious opponents on different sides, rabbis and others that were serious and that raised good arguments, and I had to have good answers for their good arguments. But instead, Nadir is quoting Time Magazine and, and Google. You know, he, he wants to prove that Muhammad is like Moses, and if you type in warrior, prophet, you'll get Muhammad and you'll get Moses. I mean, and that's what, so again, here I am quoting scripture and quoting the Hebrew, just as you over and over and over and over and over. He doesn't even deal with Mekir Becha from your own midst. And, and, and uh, Meachicha, of course, completely ignores the point that, that we're focusing on that specific phrase. Yeah, so all we did was quote scripture. And again, like I said, it, it, it was really an embarrassment. And, and once he was on, I realized that this was just, he was trying to use this as a platform for his deception and now say, well, I debated Dr. Brown and, and so on. So uh, I was going to make absolutely sure that every error, every lie was exposed uh, for the sake of the truth. Right. So thanks for the clarification, Dr. Brown. And, and uh, again, we want to move beyond Nader because uh, our topic today is actually uh, on Jesus. So just to give the, our viewers a bit of background, uh, what I heard from modern day debate was that Nader Ahmad wants to do a debate on whether Muhammad was the prophet of Deuteronomy 18. And, and for me, I love to do positive apologetics. Uh, and, and I want to do, I, I don't want to defend why, or, or to basically re rebut the claim uh, that Muhammad is not who Deuteronomy 18 was about. I wanted to make a positive claim uh, that it was all about Jesus. But before we get into that, which is really our focus for today, uh, we, we, I want to, I'm going to read the text, Deuteronomy chapter 18, and we're going to read from verses 15 uh, to 19. Uh, and I'm going to ask Dr. Brown on uh, particularly, is there any possibility, before we get to Jesus, whether there's any possibility, this could refer to anyone outside of Israel. Let me read the text directly from the English Standard Version. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your brothers it is to him you shall listen just as you desired of the lord your god at horeb on the day of the assembly when you said let me not hear again the voice of the lord my god or see this great fire any more, lest i die and the lord said to me they are right in what they have spoken i will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers and i and i will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him, and whoever will not listen to my words, and he that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. And the two Hebrew words we kind of brought up just now, it's from your own midst, from among your brothers, uh, just to set the record as clear as possible, uh, especially if you have any, uh, uh, I mean, any non-Christian viewers viewing this as well, is there any possibility, Dr. Brown, any slight possibility that this could refer to someone outside of the Jewish community in Israel. Uh, it would be great to hear your thoughts. Uh, no, uh, impossible. Number nine, which is the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to imitate the abhorrent practices of those nations. 
So God's saying, don't go to the nations to find out the will of God. Don't go to the astrologers and to the necromancers and to the sorcerers. Don't go to the nations. Rather, right from your own midst, from your own brothers, God will raise someone up. So Deuteronomy 18.9 contrasts with Deuteronomy 18.15 through 18, saying, not from the nations, but from your own midst. Then the explicit language, mikirbecha, which is used multiple times in Deuteronomy to speak of your own midst as a community, Israel, and then the achicha, a phrase from your brothers, specifically that phrase or that, that uh, word cluster, specifically used only for your brethren Israel within Deuteronomy. That makes it impossible that it's talking about someone on the outside. And then lastly, in Deuteronomy, the 34th chapter, uh, it specifically says that no prophet like Moses rose up from Israel. That's, that's scripture interpreting scripture saying this was a promise of a prophet within the nation. And at, at the right, the, the end of Deuteronomy saying that prophet has not yet been raised up. So impossible. Uh, the text is 100% clear. And the whole purpose is saying, don't go outside the nation. I'll raise up a prophet from within. Now, we may have some non-Christian viewers who, who has heard Nader uh, or some other people on this, and Nader did bring this up both in his conversation with Dr. Brown and also uh, with me, that when I mentioned that, and of course, the, the standard question is, is there anywhere in scripture that these words that we mentioned, these Hebrew words could refer to a non-Israelite? Dr. Brown has clarified it can't, but um, both to Dr. Michael Brown and to myself, Nader has mentioned in Genesis 16, the word ah. Uh, uh, could refer to uh, uh, basically it says that Ishmaelites uh, were the brothers of the Israelites. Now in my debate with Nader, I pointed out that in Genesis 16, Isaac had not even been born yet. Uh, it was only much later that Isaac was born and, and Jacob was the one whose name would later in his life be changed to Israel. So it, could that, by, uh, I mean, uh, how would you respond to the claim uh, that, you know, that he made uh, that basically, you know, ah, could refer to, it shows that the Israelites are the brothers of the Ishmaelites. Yeah, first, ah is used for Edomites as well. Ah, is, ah can be used, why the ah can be used for cousin or for brother. Uh, no one argues that, everyone knows that. First, it ignores the context, which says not from the other nations, but from your own. Second, it ignores Mikir Becha. Nadir never once addressed that. I gave him opportunity after opportunity. The phrase occurs over 10 times in Deuteronomy. Every single time from your own midst means from your own people, your own community, Israel. And then lastly, there is a specific phrase in Deuteronomy, me'achicha, from your brothers. Not just the word ach in general, but from your brothers, which is a technical term, speaking of from within your own people. For example, when you are loaning money, you can loan to the nations with interest, but me'achicha, from your own brothers, there can be no interest. So again, everyone knows, just like the Hebrew word uh, Av, father, can have multiple meanings, or Ben, son, can have multiple meanings. The same thing with Ach, brother, multiple meanings. No one's arguing that, but that's not, that's not what's used. It's not just generally Ach. Uh, gene uh, yeah, it's not just Ach in general there. No, in, instead, it is from your own midst, which again, Nadir never addressed, and from your brothers, a specific technical phrase. So that's why it is universally understood by all commentators who are not coming uh, to, to argue a silly argument, that it means from Israel, as Deuteronomy 34 reinforces. So again, there is no possibility it could refer to anyone outside of Israel. So now, uh, now that we've established that, I, I just want to, before getting to Jesus, uh, some people may raise up the objection, particularly the Jewish apologists uh, that you have engaged, uh, Dr. Brown, they may bring up the fact that it refers to Joshua or that it could refer to a whole list of prophets, uh, not specifically Jesus alone. Um, how would you respond to, to such a claim, uh, particularly to Joshua? It's partially true. In other words, the immediate context is speaking of God raising up a prophet for every generation the pagan nations, <laughs> excuse me, right within their own midst, God would raise up prophetic voices to show them the direction to go. Uh, I have no argument with that, but Deuteronomy 34 is stating clearly 
uh, and this is after Joshua has been raised up, that, that no prophet like Moses has been raised up who spoke with God face to face and, and who did signs, wonders, and miracles as Moses did. In other words, Deuteronomy is telling you there is yet a greater prophet to come. That's why the New Testament uh, has, has reference was to come. That's why the Dead Sea Scrolls reference this eschatological prophet. Uh, that's why there was an understanding. That's what Peter then preaches in the New Testament in Acts 3, saying that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of this. In other words, this could be speaking of a line of prophets that culminates in the prophet. So there are many specific prophets, but then the great prophet, the Messiah. Just as you have messianic prophecy, it starts with David. There are promises given to David and then each son of David, but it is not fulfilled until we get to the greater David. So it, this is not fulfilled until we get to the greater Moses. And that's what Deuteronomy 34 is telling us, that there is one still to come like Moses who has not yet come. Oh, that's great. So now, now we realize that uh, it, it could refer to a line of prophets and it basically culminates in the person of Jesus Christ. What are some evidences that you would give Dr. Brown uh, to say that this ultimately is, that, that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment, apart from the fact that Stephen cites this in Acts chapter 7 and Peter citing this in Acts chapter 3? All right, so obviously we have New Testament authors pointing to this. What's interesting, as I mentioned, is that there was a Jewish expectation about this coming eschatological prophet. So uh, th this was not a, a new idea. You ask, where did this idea come from? Well, likely from the explicit testimony of Deuteronomy 34. So we notice that similar words are used, raise up, up a prophet. So the root lakum and then navi, prophet. So to raise up a prophet. And then like Moses, all those words are used in Deuteronomy 18 and then Deuteronomy 34. But it specifies how this prophet will be like Moses. One, he spoke to God face to face. So we read in Numbers 12 that whereas to, to the others, God would speak in dreams and visions and things like that, he spoke to Moses face to face. In other words, just like you and I are talking back and forth in this way, that's how God communicated with Moses. There was no other prophet in Israel's history that had that relationship with God. But Yeshua, the Son of God, did, would commune, interact back and forth with his Father in that unique way. Not only that, but Moses' ministry was noted for spectacular signs, wonders, and miracles. Even though Elijah one time calls down fire from heaven, and, Elijah, and Isaiah is involved with, with a sign prophecy with, with Hezekiah and the, the sundial is turned back a certain number of degrees. Even though those things happened, their lives and ministries did not have the same demonstration of divine power, signs, wonders, and miracles that Moses did. But Jesus, for three years, performed signs, wonders, and miracles, the likes of which Israel had never seen, uh, both in terms of authority over nature, both in terms of authority over demons and disease, both in terms of demonstrating God's healing and delivering power in many, many different ways. So uh, he was a prophet like Moses, and then uh, he functions prophetically. He warns uh, his Jewish people about the coming destruction of Jerusalem and their scattering to the ends of the earth until the end of the age, these extraordinary prophecies as well. So he proves his prophetic pedigree, and uh, he is else before him ever lived up to that right so the, the, the signs and wonders that we're talking about and we're also going to be looking at the fact that he prophesies uh, the, the the destruction of jerusalem itself but uh this this is really interesting if you and i guess if you analyze uh the signs and wonders that jesus does uh you would i guess you can see some sort of a parallel now it, of course in our discussions with uh Non-Christian, sometimes it, they just brush it off and they say, well, it doesn't matter. But for example, Moses' first miracle uh, was actually, uh, uh, the, the first plague uh, that he brought about was to turn this, this river Nile uh, into blood. And we find that Jesus, uh, his first miracle, almost like a parallel, uh, turning water into wine, 
which he later identifies as his blood. Uh, and you find that you know, Moses feeding uh, the people in the wilderness miraculously with bread. Jesus feeds people in the wilderness miraculously with bread. You, you see G Moses splitting open the Red Sea and, and walking, on, I mean, walking on dry ground. Jesus doesn't even split the sea. He walks on the sea itself. Uh, and, and these things are spectacular in that these are like almost like the exact nature of miracles uh, that was performed by Moses. Yeah, and I, I love those illustrations, Samuel. It also points to the difference in function. You know, we know in John 1.17 that the law was given by Moses, the divine teaching by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus the Messiah. So, for example, the, uh, the wedding feast miracle has a, has a different uh, point to it. It's more celebratory uh, because God is coming to redeem his people and give life to the Messiah whereas these first miracles were judgments on Egypt. So you can compare and contrast and see ultimately how Jesus functions as the greater Moses. Oh, absolutely. The contrast is really spectacular because uh, while we, 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 we admit that Jesus is a prophet like Moses in that there's, there's similarities, uh, but there's also interesting contrast. For example, one of the ones that was, was quite shocking to me uh, was that uh, Moses is told towards the end of Deuteronomy that he's not going to be crossing the Jordan. His ministry falls, uh, ends right uh, before the Jordan River, uh, the Jordan. But Jesus' ministry begins at the Jordan. So it's almost like he be Jesus begins where Moses left off. Uh, and, and if you see the, the, the contrast, uh, basically while Moses' miracles, as you said, Dr. Brown brought uh, plagues upon uh, the nation of Egypt, uh, Jesus' miracles liberates people because it seems like the arch enemy, the arch enemy is not uh, a physical Pharaoh. It's actually the spiritual Pharaoh, Satan. Yes, and we can also note that, that Moses only goes so far, and it's Joshua who takes the people into the promised land. Well, of course, Jehoshua is the long form of the name Yeshua. So Yeshua is the one who fulfills what Moses started, just as Joshua brings the people over into the land and completes Moses' mission. It's significant that when you get to Revelation 15, you have the song of, of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Uh, they work together. And one completes what the other started. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, just amazing and spectacular in and of itself. I, I did want to talk about the destruction which you mentioned, uh, Dr. Brown. You, you, you mentioned just now that, uh, you know, that Jesus predicted the destruction. Does that fit into what Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 19 is talking about when it says that, you know, if the people fail to listen to the prophet that the Lord would send in his name, it says that the Lord himself uh, will require it of them. And that's kind of like a, to avenge, I guess. Uh, yes, yes. There'll be judgment on that individual, but obviously judgment on the nation if the nation refuses to hear. So here's one of the great questions that arises in traditional Judaism. And it's this, why is it that the first temple, which had idolatry, and immorality, injustice, these various sins, why is it that the first temple was destroyed and the exile only lasted for 70 years? But then the second temple, which was largely purged of idolatry and some of these other sins, that when the second temple was destroyed, in Talmudic days, it had already been several hundred years it had not yet been rebuilt. Now we are almost 2,000 years later, it has not yet been rebuilt. Uh, the Talmud actually has a very weak answer to that and says, well, it was baseless hatred between the Israelites that caused it. No, it was baseless hatred toward the Messiah, the prophet, the preeminent prophet. When he was rejected, it brought a far more severe judgment on the nation than the previous judgments. And, and, and just, to, just to add on to that, it, it seems that the duration as well is quite similar uh, in terms of the judgment that came upon uh, the people of Israel. During Moses' time, the generation that rejected Moses perished for 40 years in the wilderness. The generation that rejected Jesus perished about exactly 40 years later uh, in, in, in AD 70. And, and the idea of 40 years is not really... Uh, what we are saying, I guess, uh, the Yoma 39b kind of mentions that 40 years, uh, isn't it, the Jewish Talmud? Uh, yes, there's a Talmudic tradition that says the last 40 years before the temple was destroyed, 
that the sacrifices on the Day of Atonement were not accepted by God. And of course, there are various theories for this in traditional Judaism, but it does happen to reference this 40-year period. Now, we know the crucifixion takes place roughly 40 years before the destruction of the temple. The children of Israel wander actually, you know, 38 years, but, but 40 is the, the full number given from when they came out of Egypt. So it's, it's very similar here. And, and in a backhanded way, the Talmud is saying something happened dramatic 40 years before the temple was destroyed because of which the sacrifices, the normal sacrifices were no longer accepted by God. Well, we can say what happened. First, God provided a better way. That was the sacrifices were pointing towards. Second, God was rebuking the rejection of his son and thereby not accepting the other atonement sacrifices of the people. Right. And, and this is just, I mean, it's just amazing when you think about it, uh, the, the, the parallels between uh, Jesus and Moses in terms of that. And, and I guess it's a fair point, right, Dr. Brown, to, to basically just to summarize what you said, uh, to allude uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 uh, to basically Deuteronomy 18, 19, which says that the Lord will require it, in this case, the nation. Just to summarize that point. Yes. And Acts, the third chapter, Peter makes that very argument. He he quotes from that very passage and says, look, God sent the Messiah first to Israel uh, to, to bless us by turning us from our wicked ways, but there will be severe consequences if we refuse to hear his word. And, and notice, in God's great mercy to Israel, the crucifixion was bad enough, but Peter in Acts 3 says, you acted in ignorance and unbelief. So to those watching now that, that may have rejected Jesus your whole life, you may have done it in ignorance. You may have done it because you were taught to do it, and that's what you understood. But now, as you're watching the lights going on, and you're realizing there's truth here, this is when you have to respond. So God was willing to forgive Israel, uh, the leaders of Israel, for giving the Messiah over to be crucified. He was willing to do that. But when they rejected him after his resurrection, that sealed the coming judgment. Right. And, and I, I want to move forward from the judgment uh, to also look in terms of the gospel accounts as well. Uh, because I think to, to, to someone who is just, uh, just skimming through the gospel of Matthew in particular, it, it, they, they may not get the idea that Matthew is actually trying to portray Jesus as this new Moses, this becomes an important theme in the, in the Gospel of Matthew. Do, do you see that, uh, in, in, particularly in, in the way he responds to the Jews, uh, uh, Matthew is doing that, trying to put Jesus as the new Moses? Yeah, now, now Matthew, of course, is, is presenting Jesus as the fulfillment of, of that which is written in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible. So uh, he is the greater David, and he even embodies uh, what happened with the nation of Israel happens with him as well. Uh, but early on in Matthew's gospel, uh, he speaks of the attempt to kill the baby Jesus, you know, to kill all the baby boys born in Bethlehem, which immediately reminds you of the attempt to kill, uh, to kill Moses when he was a boy that, that Pharaoh had an edict that all baby boys uh, born would be killed. So there's an immediate a shout right there to say there's a pattern parallel as it happened to Moses the deliverer in his day so also it's happening to the Messiah the deliverer in his day and and then there are other parallels that that Matthew brings out as well when we get to Matthew 5 17 it's important to realize that Yeshua says I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets but to fulfill so he is there to fulfill beginning with Moses what Moses has written and of course in John's gospel he says if you believe Moses you believe me because he wrote about me. I'd love to hear some of the other uh, examples you find, Samuel, in Matthew, where uh, you see him painting Jesus as the new Moses. Oh, absolutely. I, I find it quite interesting that the Gospel of Matthew has uh, about five sections of teachings of Jesus, yep. uh, which yep. seems to parallel the five books of Moses, right? I, I think that would be a fair uh, comparison between the two. Yeah, uh, scholars recognize uh, that there's a certain clause that Matthew uses that divides the book into five parts. So again, that's on the model of the Pentateuch as well. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and, and as well, I think the, the idea that Jesus gives the law, I mean, he, he basically, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus uh, almost giving his new rendering of the laws of Moses, dealing with covetousness and, and everything that the Ten Commandments deals with. Uh, but And it's coming from the Mount as well. We, from the we Mount, have, yes, exactly. As, as, and, and those are the hints uh, Matthew is expecting uh, the Jews to get when, when he's writing to them, right? Again, as you have, yeah, as you have the parallels with the nation, as it happens with the nation, so with the Messiah. So the nation is in the wilderness for 40 years. Yeshua goes into the desert for 40 days. And then when Satan comes to test him, uh, Jesus responds with, with three verses from Deuteronomy, which are the, the uh, uh, verses during the wilderness wanderings themselves. So that, yeah, the, 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 the overall parallels, the overall structure, the overall message, absolutely so. Uh, in terms of the points that Matthew is making. And yes, uh, any literate Jewish reader uh, would recognize this at once. And, and I guess we can move on to also talk about uh, the, their relationship with God because Deuteronomy chapter 34 basically talks about the, the Moses was unique among all the prophets based on the way he related to God. And we kind of touched on that earlier, face to face. Uh, when you look at, I mean, Jesus' uh, relationship with the Father, uh, very often it, it's, it's identical in the sense that not, not quite in, because we, we know that Jesus is God, but uh, there is a face to face communication between Jesus and the Father. Yes, uh, the way that he speaks with him. Uh, as if he's talking to someone right there. When he ministers, he said, I can only do what I see the Father doing and the works I'm doing. It's the Father in me. I mean, this intimacy, which is extraordinary. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That goes even further. Again, it's someone greater than Moses. Um, but, you know, just for example, in John 11, when Jesus is praying before he raises Lazarus, he said, I'm not praying for their sake because I know you always hear me. I'm not doing this for my sake, but for theirs, I know you always hear me. And, and then even, you know, when, when he cries out in John, uh, in John 12, and then God responds back immediately. Some people think it's thunder, you know, but he's, this is the, the intimacy, the, the, the back and forth, even his communion with God on the cross indicates uh, that level of, of intimacy. Uh, so again, it, it, it separates him. And then uh, his relationship with the father was, was such that he had special revelation and insight. You know, you have, uh, for example, Luke 7, where Simon the Pharisee is there. You know, Jesus is at his house, and there's a, a woman, you know, from Ill, Ill repute washing his feet. And, and Simon's thinking to himself, if this man was a prophet, he would know who's washing his feet. Well, Jesus actually knows what Simon is thinking. <laughs> he answers Simon's thoughts. Like, you want to know what kind of prophet I am? You know, so he's just, he just functions on a whole other level, and the only one that you can point to uh, that has that type of backing intimacy before him is Moses, but he goes beyond Moses. And that's what Hebrews argues, that, that the one who built the house is, is the greatest of all. Oh, indeed. Uh, Hebrews 3, I believe, is a fascinating comparison between Jesus being the greater Moses, but it compares the two. But I find uh, uh, the, the, uh, the incident on the Mount of Transfiguration particularly interesting because here you have Moses, uh, and I guess you have Jesus there, and, and Peter, in, in all his naivety, is looking at, at, at Jesus and saying, Master, is it good for us? It's good for us to be here. Let's build a tabernacle, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses, uh, because it's good to hear from Moses now that it's here. But it's like the father cutting, ho cutting off Peter and saying, listen to him, which is kind of the same thing that Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 18, uh, that you must listen to him because if you if you want to listen to Moses, you would actually listen to Jesus. That, 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 is, there, is there more to that, Dr. Brown, you know, when you look at that parallel? Yeah, I mean, you, you have on the Mount of Transfiguration a few verses you know, from Isaiah and elsewhere being quoted uh, all together in, in, from the Psalms. But yes, that's, and remember you have Moses and Elijah there. So you have the representation of the law and the prophets uh, all pointing to this one bearing witness to that. Uh, but when, when the cloud lifts, it's just Jesus who's there. So Moses comes to bear witness to him and to say, listen to him, just as John the Immerser comes in his will as before to say, he must increase, I must decrease. So the whole role is to 
point to him so that, again, shows the greatness of the Messiah. And, you know, the more that you get into the positive argument, uh, in, in my time with, with Nadir, it was just to rebut uh, his, his uh, incredibly poor and weak arguments. But once we get into the positive arguments in more depth, you see how the whole New Testament takes this theme up in such depth. And, and you could say, well, where does the Quran do this? If this is so important to Islam, where does the Quran do this on this level? Of course, it doesn't. It doesn't point to Muhammad as, as being like Moses for X, Y, Z reasons. It, it just simply doesn't do that. Whereas here, we've got all this, this rich exposition from the New Testament to say this is how the writers understood it. And, and why did they understand it like that? Because Jesus himself opened their eyes to see. Yeah, absolutely. And I find the fact quite interesting. You actually mentioned something that I quite missed as well, which is the clouds were there and the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was there. Uh, and it, that's kind of exactly what happened to Moses as well, right? Uh, in the clouds. Yes, yes. Uh, in, in both cases, uh, the cloud would come down. For example, in, in um, Exodus 33, when Moses w would go outside the camp when Israel had sinned to commune with the Lord at the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting, that the cloud would come down in the sight of all Israel. And that was a sign of the presence of God. And here, cloud comes down on the Mount of Transfiguration. Another beautiful parallel. And I guess for me, I think the highlight of it all was actually reading an article uh, by Dr. R.C. Sproul, the late Dr. R.C. Sproul, uh, who actually uh, wrote an article entitled The Greater Pentecost. Uh, where he actually ties in saying about 52 to 53 days, I think it was 53 days after uh, Passover, uh, Moses and his people are before Sinai and the Lord comes down to Moses, only to Moses. It was very strict in, in, in the book of Exodus. It had to be only Moses. No one else could go anywhere near that mountain. Uh, never mind, I mean, not even touching it with a 10 foot pole. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, only Moses could go up to that mountain and God comes down to Moses in fire. Uh, or at least that's what the appearance is. And you find in the New Testament, after Jesus dies on the, at the Passover, 53 days later, day of Pentecost, God comes down again, except it's to all of God's people uh, in tongues of fire as well. Uh, it, 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 I just wondered, you know, just if, wondered if you could elaborate a bit on that too, and what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, Jewish tradition believes that it was at the time of, of Shavuot, Pentecost, that God revealed himself on Mount Sinai and, and spoke the, uh, the 10 words to Israel. Uh, so Jewish tradition says yes, that, and, and some would argue that that's the, the proper dating for it. But there has later been a tradition, for example, in Shemot Rabbah, so Exodus Rabbah 5, 9, that speaks of not just God coming down on Mount Sinai with fire, but it claims that he spoke with multiple languages at the same time. This is actually in rabbinic literature uh, because you had the, the mixed multitude that was there that came out with Israel. So allegedly people from many other nations that were there at the foot of Mount Sinai. So when God spoke, he spoke in multiple languages out of the fire at the same time. So <laughs> there you have another striking parallel. Again, this is just in rabbinic literature, but it understands the word kolot which uh, is not only taken to be thunder, but literally means voices, that it was plural voices because of God speaking in plural languages out of the fire. Uh, so according to rabbinic tradition, this took place at the first Pentecost, fascinatingly enough. Oh, absolutely. That's mind blowing. Yeah, because I've, I've never heard about this before. So yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's really amazing when you put Jesus side by side. And, and I guess that, uh, you know, just for our viewers who are watching this, you know, what, what, what we, we discuss, you know, sometimes Jesus, uh, you know, whether Muhammad is a prophet like Moses or not, sometimes it's great to go as well into the positive side to actually see uh, the New Testament unveil how Jesus is uh, this greater uh, Moses. Uh, I, do, I do want to also just uh, briefly uh, get your thoughts on whether there are any other similarities, uh, Dr. Brown, particularly, uh, you know, the, the Passover was the most significant thing for Moses. I mean, that was where the feast was celebrated. That was the most significant thing in terms of uh, the Exodus. Uh, and you find that the Passover was also the highlight of Jesus's ministry as well, where he gives his life, God's firstborn in this case, uh, the shedding of the blood. Uh, if you could just comment on that and also if you could just share with us some other similarities that you find that you have found uh, really striking. Well, well, of course, they are 
they are both the foundation layers for their era. Uh, Moses coming with God's Torah to the people of Israel after leading them out of, of Egypt and, and initiating the Sinai covenant. And now Yeshua coming uh, to bring redemption to Israel and the world and initiating the new. They are both foundation layers. Uh, the, the fact that Yeshua fulfills what was written in Torah, that the biblical calendar finds its fulfillment in him. The, the spring feasts already have come to pass. The fall feasts will coincide with his return. The fact that Sabbath rest, you know, established by Moses, finds a spiritual fulfillment in the Son of God, and we enter into that promised rest. You, know, you have all of those, those distinct parallels that are, that are laid out. And, and then, uh, of course, Moses is from the tribe of, of Levi, and Levi gets set apart for priestly ministry. So even though Yeshua comes from another tribe, uh, he is the great high priest. So again, that's not like Moses himself. It's like his brother Aaron, but fulfilling what these models pointed to. I mean, once we start to get into that, we'd be here for hours and hours and hours opening up the ways that Yeshua fulfills what's written in the Torah. But uh, when you mention the Passover, this again is the significant feast, the beginning feast. This is the beginning of the Israelite calendar uh, according to Exodus, the 12th chapter. And when God sees the blood of the lamb, he passes over the people. The destroying angel will not touch them. So Messiah dies in conjunction with Passover. He rises in conjunction with first fruits, sends his spirit in conjunction with Pentecost, as we discussed. So even the, the whole Passover ceremony, Leviticus 23, indicates that the first day after the Sabbath of Passover is the celebration of first fruits. So here, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that the Messiah is the first fruits of those who slept. He mentions that term twice. And in 1 Corinthians 5, he speaks of the Messiah being our Passover, meaning our Passover lamb. So uh, all of that which is spoken of there finds fulfillment, finds its great goal. And then, of course, he becomes the liberator and the savior of his people, not just from Egypt, but from bondage to sin and the world. So again, these are very rich and beautiful parallels. And, and it, it's important for Christian readers to recognize just how Jewish this is, just how biblically grounded this is, that it's not that Jesus comes into the world just to establish some foreign new religion, but rather to fulfill what's written in Moses and the prophets. And that's why already in John 1, when some of the disciples come and see Nathaniel, they said, we, we found the one spoken of by Moses and the prophets. There's any real but, uh, so I think we just if you could just repeat that last sentence, I think we kind of lost you in that last sentence, Dr. Brown. Yes, so in John one already we see that some of the first disciples when they, they come to Nathaniel, they say, We found the one that was spoken of by Moses and the prophets. So right from the start, they realized he was the one that Moses and the rest of the prophets were anticipating and foreshadowing as well. Yeah, indeed. And, and one of the apostolic proclamations about the, the, the resurrection of Jesus itself is that Jesus was raised according to the scriptures. Uh, that becomes a key phrase as well. And, and when we look at, uh, for those of you who are watching at home, uh, when we look at uh, uh, the, 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 uh, what convinced the disciples that ultimately Jesus rose from the dead, you will be shocked to realize that uh, it wasn't actually the empty tomb. It wasn't actually uh, even Jesus' post-mortem appearances. What ultimately convinced the disciples that Jesus had truly been raised from the dead was when Jesus says in Luke chapter 24, verse 44 to 46, uh, that he opened up the scriptures to show them how he, all of them had been predicted, beginning with Moses uh, and all of that. He shows how he is the ultimate fulfillment of it all. So uh, particularly if you're there saying that, you know, you would only believe this if you hear it from the words of Jesus as well. Show me where Jesus claims this. Um, there's an embarrassment of evidence for that. Uh, but for those of you who are believers who are watching this at home, I hope this has really whetted your appetite uh, to, to get into the Old Testament to see where Christ is revealed, not just a New Testament, 
Testament idea, but very much uh, an Old Testament idea as well. We're going to just ask one more question to Dr. Brown, um, and this is, how can we use uh, Jesus and Moses? How can we use this in evangelism? Because ultimately, our goal is to communicate the gospel. How can we do this uh, in recognizing the parallels between Jesus and Moses? Yeah, uh, three ways. First, we can show people how rich and amazing the Bible is and, and even show them how these themes are, are woven together and how these themes are laid out prophetically. People are always interested in books that predict the future. And you say, you know, look at the interesting way in which the Bible does this. So that's, that's one thing just for your general person from a non-religious background. Some of the parallels, some of the things we laid out, isn't that interesting? When sharing the gospel with a Jewish person, this helps underscore how Jewish these things really are. By Jewish, I mean biblically based in Tanakh and the Hebrew Bible. That, that rather than looking to some religion that seems very foreign to them, they associate with cathedrals and popes and people in you know, long gowns and whatever. And you know, not saying that you can't have an outfit, you know, but they just associate with something very foreign to them. You say, no, no, this is, this is our Bible. These are, the, this is our hope. This is someone that is from our own midst, right? Mikir Benu, Me'echenu, you know, from, from our midst, from our brothers. Uh, so in, in, in showing Jewish people, that's effective. And then, obviously, with a Muslim, to say, no, it obviously can't be Muhammad. That takes around three seconds to prove that. But let's, let's show how, how he is the one. He is, he is the, the, the one like Moses. Because... Again, they're already arguing in this direction because in Islamic thinking, they have to somehow find proof from the scripture that Muhammad has prophesied. It's, it's one of the, among the many weak planks of Islam, one of the weakest would be this one. So uh, here, you know, that's easily demolished. But now that you've got someone's attention, let's build a positive argument. And, and by the way, I know you wanted to draw attention to my, my newest book which I just wrote in the midst of the, the coronavirus crisis called When the World Stops, that is available. But I should mention that the book we would have been talking about uh, in light of some of our subject matter just came out in, in March, but got eclipsed by the virus. And it's called Resurrection, Investigating a Rabbi from Brooklyn, a Preacher from Galilee, an event that changed the world. I think your viewers would find that really, really fascinating. It's, it's arguing for the reality of the resurrection based on a brand new argument, based on contemporary Jewish beliefs and practices and a contemporary Jewish movement, which underscores the reality of the biblical accounts, which underscores how shocked the disciples were uh, to see Jesus rise from the dead because they, they didn't have a paradigm for it and their, their ears were deaf to what he had been saying. So for those into apologetics, I think you'll find this absolutely fascinating. I was thrilled to get endorsements by Gary Habermas and, and Michael Acona, who are top resurrection scholars today. So if you want to check that out, it's called Resurrection, Investigating a Rabbi from Brooklyn, a Preacher from Galilee, and the Event that Changed the World. And the coronavirus book, uh, which is relevant for today and hopefully years from now, called When the World Stops. Uh, for those living in the States, it's on a super discounted sale on Kindle. I just discovered that late last night on Amazon. So if you want to download the ebook at a great Jewish discount, you can do that. <laughs> It's a great Jewish discount. Well, for those of you watching, this will be in the, the links to both of Dr. Uh, Brown's books will be in the description box uh, as well. Uh, and you can, you can uh, I guess we'll, we'll put the links to Amazon, uh, which I think is the place where the discount is for the Kindle. Uh, is that, that, that uh, that's correct, right? Dr. Yes, Brown? exactly so. Exactly so. Right, right. So, uh, well, before we sign off, uh, we, we just want to ask uh, if Dr. Brown has any message in particular for uh, Malaysian viewers or those of you who from Malaysia in particular, because Explain Apologetics primarily is a ministry that is based in Malaysia. If you have any message, Dr. Brown, for anyone aspiring to do apologetics uh, uh, in Malaysia, if you have just any broad general message for, for them. Yes, uh, I'd say a few things. One, that you must really have a solid relationship with God yourself, where you really know him and are intimate with him, and that you know the word well. Many times we, we get caught up on all kinds of secondary things, and we become well-versed in theology and philosophy, 
and the beliefs of other religions, but we don't know our own scriptures as well as we should. So know the Lord well, know the scriptures well, and rely on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have our intellect, we do the best we can, but then we ask the Holy Spirit to work and speak and act. And then living in a country with such a large Muslim population, the harvest is ripe. There are certainly many who are seeking, who have questions, who are looking for the truth, and you could be God's vehicle for them to come to eternal life. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a joy and privilege, Dr. Brown, uh, having you with us. Uh, thank you once again so much for this. My joy. God bless you. Right. And, and for those of you watching, we hope that you've enjoyed this. We've, we've definitely enjoyed bringing this to you. Uh, and we hope that uh, what you can do, if you want to follow more of Dr. Michael Brown's ministry, uh, you could go to Ask Dr. Brown. That's his official uh, YouTube channel um, and, and also his website. Uh, is it uh, Line of Fire, uh, Dr. Brown? No, the website, best website is askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org. So YouTube channel, Ask Dr. Brown. Uh, website askdrbrown.org. Yeah, we'll, we'll link those two as well. Uh, in addition to the two books we mentioned just now in the description box so that you can directly click to them. We'll I'll strongly uh, encourage you, particularly if you're interest in, interested in doing apologetics from the Old Testament, Dr. Brown is a world-renowned expert apologist on that area itself. So it's been a great joy being with you. Uh, we hope this benefits you. If you haven't quite subscribed to Explain Apologetics yet, I'll encourage you uh, to do so. And until we meet next time, on behalf of Dr. Brown and myself, Samuel Nason, Bye for now.